All right, so let's talk about AFib. I am a cardiac electrophysiologist. Like Van is an interventional, I subspecialize into electrical circuits of the heart, dealing with uh, faster heartbeat, slow heartbeat, passing out, uh, pacemaker, defibrillators, all that um, sort of game. So Van already discussed with you what a heart issue is, what a plaque is. Many times I get this question, I put this slide up just for the reason, because this is a very common question I get asked. What is a heart disease? When somebody walks into my office and say they've got atrial fibrillation, I get question is, on my insurance physical, should I say I have a heart disease? It's a big question. You know, you are applying for life insurance, or you're applying for disability or something. Question gets asked is, do I have a heart disease or not? It's a very broad term. Heart disease is a broad term used to describe a range of diseases. Either you can have a coronary disease like heart attack and stroke, or you can have an arrhythmias. So yes, that considered as a heart disease. Van talked about the coronary disease, whether you gotta build up in a plaque, you gotta block artery, which leads to chest pain, shortness of breath, heart failure, stroke symptoms. And it also includes the heart arrhythmias. There's different kinds of rhythm issues, whether the electrical impulse causes you to uh, heartbeat too fast, too slow, which causes arrhythmias. There's different kinds, atrial fibrillations, um, rapid heart rates, PVCs, PACs. There's multiple things that come into the play. The heart of the matter is there's different people, different race, different gender, but this is the heart disease is one of the most common arrhythmia and common events in the United States. Afro-American female affecting 47.3% of the time, it's the leading cause of the death. You put down all the cancers together, you put down prostate cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, you put all of these together, heart disease still beats the number one cause for the death for all of them. But we underestimate that, we see a lot of Susan Kuman watch, we see the watch for walk for breast cancer, we see the walk for Alzheimer's, we have a walk for American Heart for the heart walk. But not many people show up because people still underestimate what's the event rate of this sudden heart death is. 82.6 million adults have heart disease. Afro-American females, 47.3% of them are going to have a heart disease in one shape or another. And white females, 33.8%. So there's a definitely disparity, and that's what we need to look into all these things. Hispanic females, 30.9%. That's why every patient that walks into our office, we treat them with each individuality. That's what we need to look at and say, hey, how this patient will get benefit from this treatment versus this treatment? Sometimes we may be very aggressive in treating cholesterol in somebody, or sometimes we may be very aggressive in treating the atrial fibrillation in somebody. We may treat atrial fibrillation in females with anticoagulation much more aggressive than we do that in males sometimes. And the part of that is in atrial fibrillation, females have a higher risk of stroke as compared to the males. Similarly, if Afro-American patient walks into the office, we look at that patient and say, hey, if a patient has an atrial fibrillation, this patient's probably gonna have more underlying valve issues. And if the white male comes into the office with the atrial fibrillation, I look at that and I say, this patient is most likely gonna have underlying coronary artery disease as well as compared to the other patients. So every patient gets individual treatment because this is what the data shows it to us. Experts say is estimate one in two women will die of heart disease or stroke compared with one in 25 women who will die of a breast cancer. So even though so that way we have so much awakening about the breast cancer, but we don't talk much about the heart disease in this aspect. That's why we wanted to bring this program to the public so they can understand where we stand. Heart disease being like Van said, heart disease being overweight, obese, having high blood pressure, prevalence among women as they age. Some people have accepted this as a way of life, but like Van said, heart disease and the most risk factor can be prevented. Take responsibility for your health. Let's talk about the AFib. One of my favorite topics, atrial fibrillation and sudden cardiac death. These are one of the two topics very close to my heart. This is in 2012. 
we had 6.54 million people in the United States with atrial fibrillation. San Francisco, 700,000. LA, 3.8 million people. Miami at 400,000. And Philadelphia at 1.5. So this is in 2012. By 2035, you will have 11.4 million people. Boston with 600,000, Chicago with 2.8, LA goes to 3.8, Houston 2 million, Philadelphia 1.5. And the reason is you know, atrial fibrillation is one of the most common arrhythmia in the United States. One third of the people above the age of 65 are going to have atrial fibrillation or not. Just like we get the cataracts, just like we get arthritis, just like we get gray hair, people are going to get the atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation may start in some as a brief episodes where the episodes come and go, and in some people it's gonna get more frequent as the time goes on, they get more longer, and then people stay in atrial fibrillation. That's how the atrial fibrillation work. It's the arrhythmia of the aging. We do see that in young patients, there's some reversible causes, of overactive hyperthyroid, all these things can do that. But this is one of the biggest epidemic we have. This is the most common arrhythmia in the whole wide world. This is Google, if you put down the treatment, if you just Google atrial fibrillation treatment, in March of 2010, you had 1.9 million hit, people trying to figure out what's the right way to treat. This is so common, the arrhythmia, everybody gets it, everybody wants to have a treatment, doctors talk, but not everybody is electrophysiologist. They talk to the cardiologist, but not everybody has access to electrophysiologist, so people are still trying to figure it out. By March 2011, there was 2.5 million, by January 2012, 9.5 million people have trying to figure out just to find out what is the right treatment for atrial fibrillation. It's the most growing problem associated with greater morbidity and mortality. Atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia and it keeps on growing as I mentioned. It increases the risk of stroke. Five million people with AF in the United States expected to be more than double by 2050 five times the greater risk of stroke with AF. So if you have AF today and if you didn't have the AF yesterday, your risk of stroke goes up by five times right away without changing anything, without changing your weight, without changing your height, without eating what you do, the risk of stroke goes up by 5%. And the risk of stroke, higher risk stroke risk for older patients and those with prior stroke or TIA, 15 to 20% of all the strokes are related to atrial fibrillation. That's why sometimes you will see that people have a stroke in the hospital, they went and they had multiple studies done, they say their carotid was okay, this and that. But many times it could be just related to atrial fibrillation. You may have some AFib, it caused a stroke, and now the AFib is back to normal, so nobody could figure out what exactly happened. Your carotids are clean, but this is what you need to focus on as well. The stroke related to atrial fibrillation is greater in disability compared to non-atrial fibrillation-related stroke. What that means is, when Dr. Krisko was showing you the slide, the clock, the plaque builds up in the carotid and it breaks off and it causes a stroke. Stroke caused from atrial fibrillation is much more disabling than the cause of the stroke from the plaque rupture from the carotid. That's why we need to treat the atrial fibrillation very, very aggressively because there's a higher morbidity and mortality stroke reoccurrence rate too. If you had one stroke, very high likelihood of having a second stroke in that situation unless it's treated. So question is, how do we treat the atrial fibrillation? There's different ways. There's a rate control versus rhythm control. Who requires anticoagulation and which ones? And what is the role of AFib ablation? This is the basic bottom line which comes to when you are going to a doctor's office, this is what you're gonna talk about. This is what he's gonna talk to you about in all these steps. So priorities in the management of atrial fibrillation, when we treat somebody walks into their offices, you do the rate control. If you are in atrial fibrillation, I wanna make sure, how do you feel? Do you feel short of breath? Do you feel palpitation? Do you have a difficult time sleeping? Many times people would say every time they go into atrial fibrillation, they have to get up and go to the bathroom. It's a very different symptom it presents. Some people have paroxysmal AFib, which means their AFib comes and goes. They don't have it all the time, but when they get it, they feel short of breath, they feel lightheaded, they feel dizzy, or it could be persistent AFib where they're in AFib all the time and it just decreases their energy. They can't do what they could do that before. When they check their EKG, their heart rate is running at 110, 120. When they try to walk and do some exercise, their heart rate speeds up to 130s, 140s. And that's why they can't do anything which they want to do. So in that case, you try to aggressively control their rate. Slow down the heart rate, make them feel better, that's one. Then you try to talk about, one is how you make you feel, second, I want to make sure you don't have a stroke. 
that's where we talk about the blood thinners, Coumadin and the newer agent we call the NOACs, and I'll talk to you about that as well. And then we talk about the rhythm control. As an electrophysiologist, I'm a very strong believer in that I wanna keep you in rhythm, not just leave you in the age of fibrillation, so anything I can do to put you back in rhythm and keep you in rhythm, that will be my goal to go forward. So theoretical benefits of rhythm control, so why do we wanna go over the rhythm control? Why do I not leave you in the age of fibrillation? Why do I wanna put you back in normal sinus rhythm? Multiple things, it improves your hemodynamics, that's what the heart is supposed to do. You're supposed to have a normal heartbeat, so that's what the heart likes. You can have a relief of symptoms, the way it makes you feel, the tiredness, fatigue, shortness of breath, dizziness, palpitations, lightheadedness, weight gain, swelling in the legs, all these symptoms could be related to heart, the atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure, all these things come into play. Improved exercise tolerance, reduced risk of stroke, and avoidance of the blood thinners. So many people will come to me, do something, so I don't want to have to commit to the blood thinners for the rest of my life. This is the article published in 2002. It was the New England Journal of Medicine, comparison of rate control and rhythm control. So the question was, is it any better than that or not? And it clearly showed that the people who had the rhythm control had a less events as compared to people who just did the rate control. So our approach in our practice in evidence-based practice is we try to do the rate control as a preferred strategy. People, this is actually an outdated slide. This age doesn't matter. But for people who are less symptomatic, who have a recurrent atrial fibrillation, who's been failing the antiarrhythmics and unlikely to maintain the sinus rhythm, like very, very enlarged left atrium, but we go for the rhythm control as a preferred therapy. This is what we like to do as a rhythm control where we can prefer to keep you in rhythm in people whose first episode of atrial fibrillation, reversible causes like alcohol, symptomatic patient despite the rate control, unable to take the blood thinners, heart failure, or worsened by AFib and young people. The youngest ablation I've done in the atrial fibrillation is in 21-year-old kid who had already been atrial fibrillation three or four times, shocked multiple times. That was my first thing. I was like, okay, let's just fix you up so that way and that kid has done very, very well. Rate control options. Um, this is a common list of uh, medications you will see uh, people take. Beta blockers. Um, calcium channel blockers like verapamil, deltazem, digoxin. Sometimes we'll use the amiodrone, multac. Um, AV junction ablation and pacemaker is um, used as a last resort, not as a first line resort, um, but I'll talk to you about that as well. So question becomes is, who requires the blood thinners? Does everybody get a blood thinner or because I told you the risk of stroke goes up by five, per, five times. If it's my son, my daughter, I don't want them to have a stroke. If it's my father, my mother, I don't want them to have a stroke. So what can we do to prevent the stroke? We used to follow what we call the CHAD score. This is called the CHAD2. As an alphab alphabetical, you say C-H-A-D-S, so congestive heart failure, hypertension, age, 75 or more, diabetes and stroke. Stroke gets two point, everything else gets one point. So everybody can calculate sitting here what their CHAT score is, right? So somebody who's 75 with a high blood pressure, their CHAT score is two right there. Somebody's got a heart failure, congestive heart failure, hypertension more than 75 with the diabetes, now you've got a CHAT score of one, two, three, four. Somebody who's 75 had a stroke, their CHAT score is three already. So how does it help? If it's a zero chat score, that's a low risk. Their risk of stroke is 1.2 to three strokes per 100 patient years. One to two points, moderate risk, 2.8 to four, and more than three point high risk. So you can clearly see that, that the chat score calculation was very helpful for us to figure out who needs a blood thinner and who doesn't. There were some issues in this chat score calculation. It doesn't take into the consideration because people are getting younger and having AFib. So this only takes into more than 75. Then Dr. Crisco talked about the peripheral arterial disease or vascular disease. What if the people have it? Is it a risk factor? Then we went to what we call a CHAD VASC2 now. This is what we follow these days. We call a CHAD VASC2. As the name suggests, you say C-H-A-D-S. 
one point for each, two points for certain things. And then we went into the vascular disease we added. So somebody's got a blockage or a plaque build up somewhere, that gets an additional point. Age 65 to 74 gets a point, and female gender gets a one point. So you see, we're trying to simplify. This thing is not meant for any other reason except to make sure we can cut down the risk of stroke. So CHAD's score of zero was 1.4%. CHAD's VASC two of zero is zero events. So if somebody got a CHAD VASC of zero, in that case, we don't have to use the blood thinner because we don't want to expose them to unnecessary risk of bleeding. But if you got a CHAD VASC of one, you got a 0.6% risk of stroke. So our approach is if use the blood thinners if the ischemic risk of stroke is more than 0.9% per year. That means the risk of bleeding versus risk of preventing the stroke is better if you got a point chad vast score of one or higher. You use the blood thinner to treat them. This is what we had in the past. For all these 35 years, 40 years, this is all we had available was the blood thinners, the warfarin and it used to be the rat poison, we used to call it. And then we modified it, we could monitor it, and that's how we uh, did the blood test. This is the old 2008 atrial fibrillation clinic, and the main thing was, no matter what we do, we noticed that the rate of stroke in patients with non-valvular AFib and at least one risk factor exceed that of hemorrhage from chronic anticoagulation. Because this was a common question we get asked all the time. Doc, what if I start to bleed in the brain, or what if I start to bleed in the gut, or what if I start to bleed somewhere else? Yes, you can. This is all the blood thinners. There's a high risk of bleeding. Of course there is. But the, with adding the risk, your risk of stroke is much higher than your risk of bleeding. We all take chances in these days. We drive the car. Is there a risk of being hit by somebody? Of course there is. But getting from point A to point B with your safe driving, you may be much better that way. So yes, we take chances, but that's if your risk is more, you have a better chance of preventing the stroke with the blood thinner than you having a risk of bleed. We all talk about the black box warnings on the new drugs. We see all the lawyers' ads on the TV for the new agents, and everybody comes and talks to me and say why there's a black box warning here and there. But everybody's been on the Coumadin for the last 35 years. We never noticed this that the Coumadin in 2006, or Warfarin, also had a black box warning saying it is a bleeding risk. But we don't have a choice, we used it, and we still do. In 2017, they came up with another warning and say consider a lower initial Warfarin dose with certain genetic variations, which they're saying is you should do a genetic test on everybody to figure out if they're gonna metabolize the Coumadin in a certain way or not, but we don't do that on every patient, we still use the Coumadin. Higher your Coumadin level, higher the risk of intracranial hemorrhage. The problem with the INR monitoring is if you see that there's a risk of stroke right here, if your INR is two and higher, your risk of stroke goes significantly low. That's why when you take Coumadin, we say you keep your INR or Coumadin level between two and three, or two to 2.5. That's mainly because this is where the risk of stroke gets low. But you see that the higher your INR starts to go, higher your risk of intracranial bleeding. If somebody's got an INR of six, their risk of stroke is low, but their risk of bleeding is higher. So this is a common problem we encountered with atrial fibrillation patient. How do we manage their INR? How do we do with the Coumadin levels? How do we do um, you know, with the testing, with the diet thing? So the question become was, how do we avoid the bleeding in the brain? Um, for those things. So elderly patients with a CVA at a special risk keep the INR less than three. Coumadin in combination with aspirin should be used with special caution in people with elderlies. Combination of Plavix with aspirin may accentuate the intracranial hemorrhage. Modest blood pressure lowering profoundly reduces the bleeding. So all these were the factors to reduce the intracranial hemorrhage. So we, what I'm saying is we all work towards having more benefit than having less risk of Blade. So Coumadin, obviously, it's more effective, reversible, inexpensive, because this is the common discussion will come to the patient, and the patient will say, why can't I just take Coumadin instead of a newer agent? 
It's slow onset of action, takes three to four days to kick in, needs a regular monitoring. It has a lot of food interactions, a lot of medication interactions, difficult titrations, and it has the vitamin K-based uh, green leafy vegetables. It will affect their uh, INR levels. So in 2011, that was the first when the ACC, or AHA, and the Heart Rhythm Society, it did a focused update on the new product that came out at that time, which was the Dabagatrin, which is called the Predexa now. So that was the first one to came out, and that showed it was non-inferior to the Coumadin. Caution when the creatinine clearance is less than 30, which means people with kidney disease, you should be careful. Half-life of 12 to 17 hour, and coagulation testing and stuff was this. So it did not need any blood tests, it did not need any uh, dose adjustment, and it was non-inferior to Coumadin or as good as the Coumadin. Then we came up with the other ones, which we call the Rivaroxaban, which is the Zeralto. Once a day, as effective or better than Coumadin, as per the studies, less hemorrhagic strokes than the Coumadin, similar reduction in the risk of ischemic strokes, less bleeding than the Coumadin, no routine lab work, no reversal agent yet, and then came the Apaxaban, which is the Aliquis, which is twice a day as effective or better than the Coumadin, less hemorrhagic stroke, similar reduction in the ischemic stroke, less bleeding than the Coumadin, lower overall mortality, no routine lab work, no reversal agent. So all these three drugs came up to the Coumadin, and this is what we are right now where we are. The newer anticoagulants, are they safer or better than the Coumadin? They have a shorter half-life, they get a less bleeding risk, subtherapeutic if misses one or two doses, lack of need of routine monitoring, you don't need to get your blood checked, you can just take the medication, people ask me question all the time, how do you know it's therapeutic, how do you know it's working in my system? It's the same way when you take a cholesterol pill or you take an aspirin, you know it's working. You take Plavix, you don't get a blood check for Plavix, you know it's working. So, Yes, it's the studies were done and they checked the levels and they looked at the studies to see if the risk of stroke was less and the stroke was less in these cases. Is, these are generally safer than warfarin, but they don't have any antidote except the Pradexa. Pradexa or Dabagatrin has the reversal agent. Cost of medication could be prohibitive because they are a little bit more expensive than the Coumadin. Who should remain on Coumadin and who shouldn't? Uh, obviously, the cost is a big factor. If you can afford the newer drugs, they are a little bit safer and better, less monitoring. Um, patients who are on the mechanical valves of any sort, they are the candidates who cannot take the new drugs. They have to be on the Coumadin. People who are not likely to comply with twice a day daily stuff like Pradaxa, Paxaban, they should be very careful with that. Um, if these drugs are not available, and people who are INR is easy to control and they're taking it, they don't have to worry about changing. How about aspirin and Plavix? I get this question all the time. I have to take the Plavix for my stent. Why can't I just take the aspirin and Plavix? Why do I have to take the Coumadin? Or why do I have to take these new agents? So the studies were done, it shows, with just the aspirin alone, it's a 3.4% risk of stroke per year. Major bleed was 1.27% per year. Aspirin and Plavix, stroke risk goes down to 2.4% per year. Major bleed at 2% per year. So obviously you're gonna have more bleed, but it does not cut down the risk of stroke from AFib like we want to be. So that's why the Coum if you got AFib, it, Coumadin or the newer agents is still the first line therapy for your treatment for risk of prevention of strokes. Um, now I'm going to talk about the modern updates on what else can we do. I didn't go into the antirhythmic agents. How do I, now I'm going into the rhythm control. Who are the people who are candidates for AFib ablation? Atrial fibrillation ablation is a procedure where we can just go find the circuits in the heart which are misfiring and we can fix that circuits to keep you in normal rhythm. So atrial fibrillation, when it starts, it starts from the left atrium of your heart. So the left upper chamber of your heart, this is the left upper chamber, that's where the atrial fibrillation starts. This is the right upper chamber, this is the left upper chamber, right lower and the left lower. This is where the point of interest is, this is where the atrial fibrillation starts from. So like atrial fibrillation, it's a, you need a trigger, 
Just like you have to light a fire, you need a trigger, which is the pulmonary veins. See this right here? This is the pulmonary vein. They bring the fresh blood from the lungs. These are the veins where the atrial fibrillation starts. Once it starts here, it trickles down, and then you got this sustainer, which is the left upper chamber is enlarged and some scar tissue in it, and it keeps the AFib keep on going there. So you need a fire. You need to start with something, and then you need a trigger, you also need a sustainer. So you got a fire, and then you need some wood to keep it going, and that's what happens. People stay in AFib, and then the heart keeps on going. So it's like an AFib, it just, once it starts, it just spreads all over. It just spreads all over your heart, and then it just takes over your rhythm. So this is the catheter-based percutaneous ablation these days we do. We can just go through the groin, just like a minimally invasive surgery, basically get to the access to the left atrium and the pulmonary veins. We call it transeptal catheterization. We go to the right upper chamber, and I'll show you the slide. We take a needle, cross over to the left side, and then we find these triggers, and we cauterize these triggers, and that puts you back in your rhythm. You can, this is the localization of vein. We can do that under the fluoroscopy, and then we use the electroanatomical, we call the 3D mapping we use. We create a map of your left upper chamber trying to find these spots, and then we isolate these pulmonary veins. Isolation of pulmonary veins means we put like a little cigarette burns all around the veins, block the atrial fibrillation from coming out. We don't block any blood flow, we just block the abnormal electrical rhythms to come out of that atri uh, the, from the veins that keeps you in rhythm, and I'll show you the success rate in these cases. So this is how we do the procedure. It's done in the hospital, it takes about a couple hours to do that. You go home the next day or same day, sometime if I do that in the morning, we go from the groin right here, we walk up all the way to here, to the right chamber, and there's a curtain between the right and the left chamber right here. We take a needle, we go through the left side, and these are the pulmonary veins, so this is where we work on all around. There's four pulmonary veins, left upper, left lower, and then there's two on the right side. This is a three-dimensional map of the left atrium. This is where your atrial fibrillation starts. Like I said, there's four pulmonary veins, one on the two on the left side, two on the right side, and this is what we, each spot what you see, this marker, is the ablation spot we do. So basically we put electrical burns like this, so abnormal rhythm cannot get out of this thing, and that keeps you in sinus rhythm. This does not damage the heart, it's very superficial burns, this does not block the blood flow, it just blocks the abnormal electrical impulses to come out so people don't go into atrial fibrillation. These days we're using a lot of what we call the cryoablation as well. The one I showed you, that is the heat. We call the radio frequency. These days we are doing a lot what we call the cryoablation, which is like a freeze. Instead of burning with heat, we freeze it with liquid nitrogen. This is the difference in when we ablate. This is the burn with the heat. This is the burn with the freeze. It's just a three, four millimeter burn deep. It's just like a superficial cigarette burn, that's all it is. But you can see the difference in that stuff. This is sort of like a cryo balloon we use, we call it. This is the thing we use to freeze. This contains liquid nitrogen. This is a double balloon, one on the outside, one on the inside, and the liquid nitrogen is in the middle, and it freezes all around, and I'll show you so this is how we do that, uh, freeze. We go to the left chamber, we identify your veins, we put it here, and we freeze all around like this. What that does, it, it just with a single burn, it can cover the whole vein. It's a newer technology we've been using, and it cuts down a procedure time for you, anesthesia time for you, recovery for you, and gets a very good results. Question is when to consider the ablation. So in people who want to try the medication first, we try the medication. There's different medications we use. We use flaconide, propofenon, amiodrone, multac. We use the sotalol, ficosin. 
So sometimes people have side effects, they get, don't want to take the medication. In that case, if they can't tolerate the medication or the antiarrhythmic therapy is not uh, effective, in that case, we consider ablation. People with very symptomatic AFib, uh, who gets very, very short of breath, very symptomatic. People with, a, as a first line therapy, who say, I don't want to take the pill, I'd rather get an ablation done, in that case, as we go as well. In other who is ablation, maybe first line strategy, patient with very symptomatic, who refuses like anterior big drug, young patients. In that case, is actually instead of giving them the medication, because every medication has their own side effect. We call them poison, pick your poison. None of the medication is safe. They all have a side effects. So say they want to go for ablation, like I said, the youngest I've done is on 21 year old. And patient with significant side effects from medication, like heart rate gets too slow because all of these will slow down the heart rate. In that case, is, instead of giving them pacemaker, we try to take them off the medication and use this drug. So who does the best? People with paroxysmal AFib. Paroxysmal AFib is their atrial fibrillation comes and goes. You have it today, you don't have it tomorrow. Six months later, you have it. You have it for a few days, then it's not there anymore. Those are the people who are going to do the best. Their the success rate goes significantly better, and I'm talking about cure. I'm not talking about just making them feel better. Younger people, less than 70 years old, they will do very well. Minimal structural heart disease who don't have a significant valve issue or left atrium is not severely dilated, those people will do very well. Able to tolerate the procedure and follow-ups, those people will do well. So the result, the success rate. So everybody asks you, what is the success rate in these cases? Do I, is it worthwhile to do this procedure? Single procedure, 60 to 80% success rate. And the range of 60 to 80% is, it depends on what your age is, what your left upper chamber size is, how long you have the AFib, if you're going to atrial fibrillation that comes and goes, you're younger, the left upper chamber is normal, your success rate could be as high as 80% chances that your atrial fibrillation will not come back. It's done, it's cured, it'll be gone. We take away all the medications at that point within three to six months. Multiple procedures, sometimes we have to do 10 to 15%. We may have to go back and do the procedure we call a second procedure. That improves your success rate to almost 80 to 90% that if we could do the first one, it doesn't work as much, six months later we go back and do the second one and it improves your success to 80 to 90%. Um, somebody who has this AFA for persistent, like more than three years, significant large left atrium, in that case ablation may or may not be very successful. Best success with paroxysmal, healthy heart, least success with chronic disease and diseased left atrium. That's why somebody's with atrial fibrillation we want to see them right away, or right away means we want to see them sooner. Don't wait for five years to come to the electrophysiologist. See them sooner. The better, you, sooner you see them, better the chances that we can put you back in rhythm. Um, some may reoccur despite the initial success. Ultimate goal is rhythm control without the toxic antiarrhythmic drug. That's what we want to go for. We want to get you off the medication. So this is like a jeopardy. We go basically say, hey, if you want to feel better, feel same, or feel worse, or live longer, live the same. If you want to feel the same and live longer, because you don't want to have a stroke and stuff, we put you on the blood thinners. That's the bottom line. That's the first line you got to do for everybody. Anybody who walks into the patients with atrial fibrillation, blood thinner is the first line to go. So don't, you know, this is the very way to go because that's what's going to make you safe. If you want to feel the same and live the same, you do the rate control. They put you on the beta blocker, digoxin, and stuff. That's going to put your heart rate under control to keep it going that way. If you want to feel better and live the same, then you go for ablation. Because that will make you feel much better. That'll put your heart in a rhythm. That'll keep the heart rate going in a longer period of time. And if you want to feel better but live a little shorter, antiarrhythmic drugs are the way to go. Not that it means it makes you live life shorter, shorter, but they have their own side effects, so that's why we go for that thing. So this is just the oral factor 10 inhibitors. I could not talk, leave this uh, without talking about all these things. This is the three drugs I just talked about, rivaroxaban, which is the Ralto, apaxaban is the Aliquis, and this is the Cerveza. These were the trial. They have been studied very, very extensively, and this is how the dosing are, but they've been very safe drugs. Uh, in place of Coumadin these days we use. My 
presentation won't be complete talking about a question because this, I know this is going to come. What if somebody cannot take the blood thinner? What if somebody cannot take the blood thinners? Somebody had a fall, had a head injury. He's bleeding in his brain. Or somebody who's taking the blood thinner now started to bleed in the gut, needing a four units of transfusion. What do we do in those cases? They still have a risk of stroke. So there are newer options which are out there. One of them is what we call the percutaneous left atrial appendage occlusion device called the Watchman. 90% of your strokes in atrial fibrillation develop in this tiny appendix. Just like you got an appendix in your body, there's a tiny appendix in the heart, okay? Just a tiny one. This is just an organ meant to cause the problems. 90% of your blood clots develop in there. So what happened is when you go into atrial fibrillation, instead of your heart beating like this, it's just this. So the blood tends to pool in the left upper chamber. It's stagnant. It's just sitting there. So it starts to form a blood clot in this tiny area. And then it shoots out from here, goes down, and goes down to the brain. That's what leads to the stroke. So 90 to 95% of the blood clots develop here. So we came up with the answer, hey, what can we fix it? So we have an option now we call the left atrial appendage occlusion device called the Watchman device. Basically, a simple procedure takes about 45 minutes to do that. This is meant for people who cannot take the blood thinners. This is meant to prevent the risk of strokes in people with atrial fibrillation. You take a little tiny device the size of a button of this size, no bigger than this, just about this big. You go in, you leave it there. There's like an anchors there. It holds on to this thing. But basically what it does is it blocks the blood flow from going in and forming a clot. We give medication for 45 days, like Coumadin, for 45 days. After that, we take you off the blood thinners forever. You may need Plavix for six months. And then after that, you just take stay on the baby aspirin. So this is the newest addition to the arsenal we have right now for preventing the risk of stroke. It's all about you. It's all about preventing the risk of stroke. That's all. There's other alternate going on, but they're not there yet. Basically, we're working on this uh, more occluded devices. There's thoracoscopic epicardial plication. Uh, it's a little bit more painful procedure. Um, and then amputation of uh, left atrial appendage, where we can just ask the surgeon to chop off the appendage. But is atrial fibrillation the cause of stroke or a marker of population at risk is where we answer it. This is where we are right now. The main thing, like from bottom of my you know, heart, I just say is that if somebody has atrial fibrillation, do talk to your physician to make sure you are on the blood thinners. If you're not for one reason or another, you can't, then talk to them about other options. And then talk about whether you can be a candidate for ablation or not. 